All right. Just about ready here. Okay, <clears throat> got some chill beats in the background. So, without further ado, hello, 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 and welcome back to uh, Storytime Saturdays. I'm your narrator, Fragath, and last week we left off about halfway through the Invisible Death by Victor Rousseau from uh, Astounding Stories of Super Science, October 1930. Um, and the last event that we had there was that uh, they discovered uh, they were being gassed, invisible neurotoxin of some kind, um, which is killing everybody. Uh, and they have discovered that the location that that gas is coming from is in the Bahamas. Abaco Island. Uh, and the people doing the gassing, of course, are the uh, minions of the Invisible Emperor, who is uh, some sort of proto-Nazi. Uh, their organization is hell-bent on um, putting everyone under despotic aristocratic rule and, uh, you know, making democracy a thing of the past. And us red-blooded Americans of 1930 are having none of it. Even though we're dying in droves. All right. So, well, more things will go boom in the night. I've got to figure out why that's still not working. Whatever, I'll fake it. Oh, one sec, something's going on with my ear. There we go. Okay. Chapter 7. On the Trail. Three hours later, about the time when the War Council rose after completing its plans, a sudden shift in of the wind blew the poison gas out to sea, just when it appeared certain that it would reach the capital of the nation. The southern half of Virginia had been swept over. Operators, telegraph, and telephone, staying at their posts, had sent in constant messages that had terminated with an abruptness which told of the tragic sequel. Yet, at that distance from its source, the intensity of the gas had been, to some extent, dissipated. Poisonous beyond any gas known, so deadly as to make hydrocyanic gas innocuous in comparison, still, as it was, swept northward on the wings of the wind, there had been an increasing number of non-fatal casualties. The most northerly po northernly point reached by the gas was Richmond, and here some 50% of those stricken had suffered paralysis instead of death. But a new element had been injected into the situation. Even the heroic courage shown by the populace in the beginning had had its limits. The morning after the news of the Invisible Death's advent was made public, mobs had gathered in all the large cities of the East, demanding surrender. The submerged elements of crime and disorder had come to the surface at last. Committees were formed with the avowed object of yielding to the Invisible Emperor. Uh, and averting further disaster. In Washington, a city of the dead, half the members of Congress and the Senators had gathered in the ruined capital to debate the situation. 
there were rumors of an impending march on the White House, of a coup d'etat. The action of the government was prompt. 500 loyalists were enrolled, armed, and posted round the White House. Every avenue of approach was commanded by machine guns. Meanwhile, the news was spread by radio that the headquarters of the Invisible Emperor had been located, and that a strong bombing squadron was being dispatched to destroy it. The entire fleet was to follow, and it was confidently anticipated that, within a little while, the terror would be at an end. Those at the White House were less sanguine. There was none but realized the diabolical strength of their antagonists. Everything depends upon the outcome of the next 48 hours, and everything depends on you, Rennell, said Secretary Norris to Dick as he stood beside his plane. Behind him, his flight of a dozen airships was drawn up. Find them, added the Secretary. Cover Abaco Island with the black gas, and the Navy and the Marines will wipe up the mess that you leave behind you. God help you, and all of us, Rennell. He gripped Dick's hand and turned away. Dick was very sober-minded as he climbed into his cockpit. He knew to the full how much depended upon himself and Luke Evans. Already the shouts of the insurgents were to be heard at the ends of the barriers, commanded by the machine gunners, and patrolled by the enlisted volunteers. Negro mobs were building counter-barricades of their own with rubble from the fallen edifices. Civil war might be postponed for eight and forty hours, but after that, unless there was news of victory, the whole structure of civilization would be smashed irreparably. It was up to Dick and Luke Evans, and they had assumed such a responsibility as rarely falls to the lot of man in war. Dick was to lead the flight in a two-seater Barwell plane. This was one of the latest types, and had been hurriedly adapted to the purpose for which it was to be used. Dick himself occupied the rear seat, with its dual controls, and the gun in its armored casing. In the front sat old Luke's at Luke Evans, in charge of the black gas projector. His famous camera box, containing a minute quality quantity of gas in slow combustion, and projecting the black searchlight, had been built into the plane. In the rack beside him were a number of black gas bombs, each of which, dropped to earth, would release enough gas to cover a considerable area with darkness. Both Luke and Dick wore respirators filled with charcoal and sodium thiosulfate, and beside Dick a cage containing three guinea pigs rested. These little rodents were so sensitive to atmospheric changes that a quantity of hydrocyanic acid too minute to affect a man would produce instantaneous death on them. From its hiding place off the Virginia coast, the American fleet was steaming hotly southward toward Abaco Island. Cruisers, destroyers, submarines. That Abaco was British territory had simply not been considered in this crisis of history. The twelve airships that followed Dix contained enough bombs to put the headquarters of the Invisible Empire out of business for good. The naval guns would complete the same business. All day, Dick and Luke Evans flew southward. It was thous. All day, <laughs> Dick and Luke Evans flew southwestward. At first glance, everything appeared normal. The catastrophe that had fallen upon the land was visible only in the shape of the lines of tiny figures, extending for miles, that choked all the roads radiating out of the principal cities. It was only when they were over the southern portion of Virginia that the ravages of deadly gas became apparent. Flying low, Dick could see the fields strewn with the bodies of dead cattle. Here and there, at the doors of farmhouses, the inmates could be seen, lying together in gruesome heaps, caught and killed instantaneously as they attempted flight. Here, too, were figures on the roads, but they were the figures of dead men and women. They strewed the roads for miles, lying as they had been trapped, Men, women, children, horses, mules, and dogs. The spectacle was an appalling one. Dick set his jaws grimly. He was thinking that the Council had let von Kettler escape. He was thinking of Fridegond. But he would not let himself think of her. 
She deserved no more pity than the rest of the murderous crew. Over the Carolinas, the conditions were still more appalling. Here, deadly gas had struck with all its concentrated power. A city materialized out of the blue distance. A factory town with all chimneys spiring to upward into the blue. A section of tall buildings intersected by canyon-like streets. Around it, a rim of trim houses, bungalows, indicative of prosperity and comfort. And it was a city of the dead. For everywhere around it, on all the roads, the dead lay piled on top of one another. For miles, all the inhabitants, rich and poor, businessmen, factory hands, negroes, there had been a mad rush as the fatal gas drove onward upon its lethal way, and all the fugitives had been overwhelmed simultaneously. Here were golf links, with little groups strewn on the grass and fairways. Here, at one of the holes, four men, their putters still in their hands, crouched in death. Here was the wreckage of a train that had collided with a string of freight cars at an untended switch, and from the shattered windows the heads and bodies of the dead protruded in serried ranks. Dick looked back. His flight was driving on behind him. He guessed their feelings. They had sworn, as he had sworn, that none of them would return without stamping out that abomination from the earth forever. He signaled to the flight to rise and zoomed upward to 12,000 feet. He did not want to look upon any more of those horrors. At that height, the peaceful landscape lay extended underneath in a checkered board of farms and woodlands. One could pretend that it was all a vile dream. He avoided Charleston and winged out above the Atlantic, striking a straight course along the coast toward the Bahamas. The shores of Georgia vanished in the west. Dick began to breathe more freely. His mind shook off its weight of horror. Only the blue sea and the blue sky were visible. The aftermath of the gale remained in the shape of a strong head breeze and white crests below. Dick glanced at the guinea pigs. They were busily gnawing their cabbage and carrots. The gas had evidently been entirely dissipated by the wind. Toward the sunset, the low jutting foreland of Canaveral on the east coast of Florida came into view. Dick shifted course a little. Three hours more should see them over Abaco. His flight had explicit instructions. As soon as the black gas had rendered visible the headquarters of the Invisible Emperor, they were to circle above, dropping their bombs. When these were exhausted, the machine guns would come into play. There was to be no attention paid to signals of surrender. They were to wipe out the headquarters, to kill every living thing that showed itself, and the Navy and the Marines would mop up anything left over. The sun went down in a blaze of gold and crimson. Night fell. The moon began to climb the east. The black sea, stretching beneath, was as empty as on the day when it was created. Nothing in the shape of navigation appeared. Two hours, three hours, and old Evans turned round in his cockpit and pointed. On the horizon, a black thread was beginning to stretch against the sky. It was Abaco Island in the Bahama Group. They were nearly at their destination. An hour more, perhaps two hours, and the deadly menace that threatened America might be removed forever. Dick breathed a silent prayer for success. They were over Abaco, a long, flat island, 70 miles or so in extreme length and fairly wide, covered with a dense growth of tropical brush and forest, with here and there open spaces, near the seacoast an occasional farmhouse. Dick dropped to 5,000, to 3, to 1. The moon made the whole land underneath as bright as day. There were no evidence of destruction by the hurricane. The farmhouses stood substantial and well-roofed. If death had struck Abaco Island, it had been the work of man, not nature. Dick zoomed almost to his ceiling, until, in the brilliant moonlight, he could see Abaco Island from side to side. For the most part, it was heavily wooded with mahogany and lignum vitae. 
Toward the central portion there was open land, but there was not the least sign of any construction work. Again he swooped, indicating to his flight to follow him. At a thousand feet he examined the open district intently. Here, if anywhere upon the island, the invisible emperor had his headquarters. Was it conceivable that a gas factory, hangars, ammunition depots could exist here invisibly when he could look straight down upon the ground? Dick's heart sank. The hideous fear came to him that Graves had been mistaken, that he had come on a wild goose chase. This could not be the place. It was quite incredible. Again and again he circled, studying the ground beneath. Now he could see that the tough grass and undergrowth marked curious geometrical patterns. Here, for example, was an oblong of bare earth around which the vegetation grew, and it was obviously the work of man. Here were four squares of bare ground set side by side, with thin strips of vegetation growing between them. Then, of a sudden, Dick knew. Those squares and parallelograms of bare ground indicated the foundations of buildings. He was looking down on the very site of the invisible Emperor's stronghold. He shouted and pointed downward. Luke Evans looked round and nodded. He understood. He patted the camera box with a grim smile on his old face. Chapter 8. The Magnetic Trap Upon those squares and oblongs of bare earth, incredible as it seemed, rose the structures of the invisible empire, themselves both invisible and transparent, so that one looked right down through them and saw only the ground beneath them. Every interior floor and girder must have been treated with the gas. They had been cunning. They must have discovered some permanent means of charging paint with the shadow-breaking gas so that the buildings would remain invisible for months and years instead of hours. But they had not been cunning enough. It had not occurred to them that the foundations would still be visible underneath, for the simple reason that grass does not grow without sunlight. Dick saw old Luke Evans nodding and pointing downward. The old man picked up his end of the speaking tube, but Dick ignored the gesture. He signaled to his flight to rise and zoomed up, circling, studying the land beneath. That oblong was evidently the central building. Those four squares probably housed airplanes, and each would hold half a dozen. That elliptical building might contain a dirigible. That round patch was probably the gas factory. Now Dick could see more patches of bare ground, extending in the direction of the sea. He gunned his ship and followed the gap among the trees to the ocean, a few miles distant. Yes, there were more evidence of activity here. Beside the water, in what looked like a deep natural harbor, was what seemed to be the foundations of a dock. Perhaps even vessels of war floated on the phosphorescent Bahama Sea. He circled back, his flock wheeling like a flight of birds and following him. He signaled to them to scatter. They had certainly been observed. At any moment, a hail of lead might assail them invisibly out of the air. They must get to work quickly. But had they understood the significance of those bare patches? Dick saw Luke Evans still fidgeting impatiently with his end of the speaking tube and picked it up. I'm thinking, Captain Rennell, we've no time to lose if we want to keep the upper hand of those devils, called the old man. Yes, you're right, Dick answered. Lay a trail of gas bombs all around those hangars and buildings, enough to hold them dark for some time, and keep a bomb or two in reserve. Luke Evans shouted back. The plane was again above the structures. The old man dropped a bomb over the side, and Dick zoomed again, Dick zoomed again, his flight wheeling up behind him. Higher and higher, banking and going round in a succession of tight spirals. Dick flew. Every moment he expected the blow to fall. As he rose, Luke Evans dropped bomb after bomb. A thousand feet beneath the flight was taking up positions. 
hovering with the helicopters, looking up to Dick for the signal and waiting. Then from beneath the black cloud of gas began to rise as Luke Evans dropped his bombs. It filled the lower spaces of the sky, blotting out the land in an impenetrable darkness. That darkness, above which Dick and his flight were soaring, rose like a solid wall built by some prehistoric race that aimed to fling a tower into the heaven. And then the miracle. Dick gasped in sheer delight as he realized that he had made no mistake. At first, all he could see was a number of crisscrossing phosphorescent lines that appeared shimmering through the blackness underneath. They ran luminously here and there, forming no particular pattern, much like the figures on the radium dial of a watch when they first come into wavering visibility at night. Then the lines began to intersect one another, to assume geometric patterns and curves, and bit by bit they took meaning and significance. And suddenly the whole invisible stronghold lay revealed upon the ground beneath, a shining, dazzling play of weaving light. Buildings and hangars stood out, clearly revealed. The rounded vault of a dirigible hangar, and the shining ribbon of a road that ran through a pitch-dark tarmac, and was evidently constructed from some gas-impregnated materials. On this tarmac was a flight of shining airplanes, ready to take off. There were the odd, ovoid figures of the aviators in their silken overalls. More figures appeared, running out from the buildings. It was clear that the sudden raid had taken them all by surprise. Luke Evans yelled and pointed, We've got them now, sir! Dick heard above the whine of the helicopter engine, We've! But of a sudden, the old man's voice died away, though his mouth was still moving. Dick leaned out of his cockpit and fired a single red very light, the signal for the attack and from each plane of his flight, beneath him, a bomb slid from its rack and went hurtling down upon the gang below, while the airplanes circled and hovered, each taking up its station. Dick was too late. By a whole minute he had missed his chance. He realized that immediately, for before the red light had flared from his pistol, the hostile planes were in the air. He had flown too low and given the alarm. It meant a fight now, instead of a mad dog destruction, and Dick did not underestimate the power of the enemy. But he felt a thrill of furious satisfaction at the prospect of battle. From every plane the bombs were falling, underneath ruin and destruction and leaping flames and yet darkness, save for the phosphorescent outlines of the buildings. And the lines of these were broken, converging into strange crisscrosses of luminosity as the beams fell in shapeless heaps. Dark fire sweeping through the headquarters of the Invisible Emperor, a veritable hell for those below, a taste of the hell that they had made for others. Then a strange phenomenon obtruded itself upon Dick's notice. Nothing was audible. The bombs were falling, but they were falling silently. No sound came up from beneath. And except for the throbbing of his engine, Dick would have thought it had stopped. He could no longer hear it. That terrific holocaust of death and destruction was inaudible. Skimming the upper reach of the air, high above that wall of darkness, Dick saw old Luke Evans pick up his end of the speaking tube, and mechanically followed suit. He could see the old man's lips moving, but he heard nothing. And now another odd phenomenon was borne in on his notice. His flight were perhaps 500 feet beneath him, hovering a little above the barrage of black gas. But they were converging oddly, and there was no sight of the airplanes that Dick had just seen taking off from the invisible tarmac. Dick fired two very lights as a signal to his flight to scatter. 
What they were do what were they doing, bunching together like a flock of sheep, when at any moment the enemy planes might come swooping in, riddling them with bullets? He thrust the stick forward, and then realized that his controls had gone dead. He thought for a moment that a wire had snapped, but the stick responded perfectly to his hand, only it had no longer control over his plane. He kicked right rudder, and the plane remained motionless. He pushed home the soaring lever to neutralize the helicopter, and the plane still soared. Then he noticed that the needle of his earth inductor compass indicator was oscillating madly, and realized that it was not his plane that was at fault. Underneath him, his flight seemed to be milling wildly as the ships turned in every direction of the compass. But not for long. They were nosing in until the whole flight resembled an enormous airplane engine, with twelve radial points corresponding to their propellers, and the noses pointing symmetrically inward like a herd of game yarding in wintertime. And now the true significance came home to Dick. A vertical line of magnetic force, an invisible mast, had been shot upward from the ground. The airplanes were moored to it by their noses, as effectively as if they had been fastened with steel wires. And he, too, was struggling against that magnetic force that was slowly drawing him, despite his utmost efforts, to a fixed position 500 feet above his flight. For a few moments, by feeding his engine gas to the limit, Dick thought he might have a chance of escaping. Her nose a fixed point, Dick whirled round and round in a dizzy maze, attempting to break that invisible mooring chain. Then, suddenly, the engine went dead. He was trapped, helplessly. He saw old Evans gesticulating wildly in the front cockpit. The old man hoisted himself, leaned over the cowling, gibbered in leaned over the cowling and gibbered in Dick's ear. The silent engine had ceased to throb, and the old man's shouts were simply not translated into sound. Suddenly, the flight beneath jerked downward, just as a flag jerks when it is hauled down a pole. They vanished into the dark cloud beneath. At the same time, there came a jerk that dropped Dick's plane a hundred feet and flung him violently against the rim of the cockpit. Another followed. By drops of a hundred feet at a time, Dick was being hauled down into the darkness underneath him. It rushed up at him. One moment he was suspended upon the rim of it, seeing the moon and stars above him. The next he had been plunged into utter blackness. Blackness more intense than anything that could be conceived. Soundless blackness, that was the added horror of it. Blackness of Luke Evans's contriving, but none the less fearful on that account. And yet, as Dick was jerked slowly downward, slowly a pale visibility began to diffuse itself underneath. The black cloud was beginning to roll away. The luminous lines began to fade, and in place of them appeared little leaping tongues of fire. In front of him, Dick saw Luke Evans's form begin to pattern itself upon the darkness. He saw the form move sidewise, and caught at Luke's arm as he was about to hurl another gas bomb. No, he shouted, and heard no sound coming from his lips. Luke understood. He seemed to be replacing the bomb in the rack. Beneath them now, as they were jerked downward, were fantastic swirls of black mist, and at the bottom, a pit of fire that was slowly coming into visibility. Dick uttered a cry of horror. Five hundred feet below his plane, he saw the dim forms of his flight, still bunched together, noses almost touching, and they were dropping straight into that flaming furnace of ruin underneath, which was growing clear clearer every instant. Down, jerk by jerk. Down. The black cloud was fast dispersing from the ground. The flight were hardly a thousand feet above the fire down. A long jerk, that one. Once more. The flames leaped up hungrily about the doomed airships. Cries of mad horror broke from Dick's lips as he witnessed the destruction of ships and men. He could see almost clearly now. 
the twelve ships, still retaining their nose-to-nose -nose formation, were in the very heart of the fire. Spurts of exploding gasoline thrust their white tongues upward. There was only one consolation. For the doomed men, death must have come practically instantaneously. From where he hung, Dick could feel the fierce heat of the flames below. In front of him, old Luke Evans sat in his cockpit like one petrified. He was feebly fumbling at his camera box, as if he had some idea of using it, and had forgotten that it was fixed to the plane, but the old man seemed temporarily to have lost his wits. Rushing flames surrounded the burning airships, reducing them to a solid, welded mass of incandescent metal. Dick looked down, waiting for the next jerk that would summon him to join his men. At the moment, he was not conscious of either fear or horror, only intense rage against the murderers and regret that he could never bring back the news of victory. The cloud had almost dissipated. In place of the phosphorescence, electric lights had appeared, making the ground beneath perfectly visible. Dick could see a number of men grouped together at the entrance of a large building, part of which had been wrecked by a bomb, though there was no evidence of fire. Other structures had been dismantled and knocked about, but what remained of them had not been charred by fire. Evidently, they had been fireproofed. Perhaps the gas itself was incombustible. Only in the middle of the tarmac, where the remnants of the airplanes blazed, was there any sign of fire. There were three machines resembling dynamos, placed one at each corner of the tarmac, equidistant from the central holocaust. A half dozen men were grouped about each of them, and by the light from the huge reflector over each, Dick saw that they were whirring busily. At the time, it did not occur to him that these were the machines that were sending out the electrical force that had held the airplanes powerless. But, as he looked, his mind still a turmoil of hate and hopeless anger, he saw one of the three machines cease whirring. The group about it dispersed, the light above went out, and now his plane, as if drawn by the power of the two remaining machines, began to move jerkily again, not down toward the burning wreckage, but sideways, away from it. Straight out toward the side of the tarmac it moved, jerked jerking downward diagonally until it rested only a few feet above the ground. Then suddenly Dick felt the plane quiver, as if released from the power of the force that had held it. It nosed down and crashed, rolled over amid the wreckage of a shattered wing. The concussion shot Dick from the cockpit clear of the smashed machine. He landed upon his head and went out instantly. Chapter 9. The Invisible Emperor It was the sound of his name, spoken repeatedly, that brought Dick back to consciousness. He opened his eyes, blinking in broad daylight. He stared about him, and the first thing he saw was Luke Evans, regarding him anxiously from a little distance away. He saw that it was Luke who had spoken. He had heard the old man distinctly. The condition of inaudibility was gone, not that of invisibility. Dick stared about him in bewilderment. For a moment, before he quite realized what had happened to him, he thought he had lost his mind. Underneath him was a thick rug, beneath his head a pillow. He could feel both of them, and yet all he could see was the open country, a clearing with shrubbery on either side, and beyond that, a luxurious growth of tropical trees. Under him, to all visual appearance, was the bare ground. He moved and heard the clank of chains. He looked down at himself. His wrists were loosely linked to a chain that seemed to stretch tight into vacancy and end in nothing. His ankles were bound likewise, and both chains appeared to be of solid silver, but thick enough to give them the strength of iron. Then he perceived that old Evans was bound in the same way. Renal! Rennell, repeated the old man in a sort of whimper. Thank God you've come out of it. I was afraid you were dead. What's happened? 
asked Dick. Where are we? Didn't they get us? They've got us, damn them, snarled old Evans. All the rest burnt as cinders, those fine fellows, Rennell. You were thrown unconscious, but none of my tough old bones were hurt. They pulled us out of the wreckage and brought us in here and tied us with these silver chains. In here? But where are we? demanded Dick, trying to pass his hand across his aching forehead and realizing that the chain, though it seemed fastened to nothing, was perfectly taut. In one of their damned invisible houses, whimpered the old man. They're fireproof. Nearly all our bombs fell on the tarmac, and they hardly did any damage at all. One of those devils was bragging about it to me. I couldn't see anything but his eyes. And they've taken away my gas box, wailed old Luke. Dick cursed comprehensively and was silent. The burning rage that filled him left him incapable of other utterance. Silver chains. They must be madmen. Yes, that was the only explanation. Madmen who had escaped from somewhere, obtained possession of scientific secrets, and banded themselves together to overcome the world. If he could get the chance of a blow at them before he died. He heard the door swing open. A door somewhere out on the prairie. Two men sprang into sudden visibility and approached him. There was nothing invisible about these men, though they had seemed to have materialized out of nothing. They wore the same black, trimly fitting uniform that Dick had seen in the White House. They were flesh and blood human beings like themselves. I congratulate you upon your recovery, Captain Rennell, remarked one of them with ironical politeness. Also upon your shrewd coup. Needless to say, it, has, it had no chance of success, but we were misinformed as to the hour at which you might be expected. We thought it would take the fools at Washington a little longer to puzzle out our location, and then we did not put quite sufficient force into our hurricane. Quite an artificial one, Captain. Dick, glaring at them, said nothing, and the one who had spoken turned to his companion, laughing and said something in a foreign language that he did not recognize. "'His Majesty the Emperor commands your presence, and that of this old fool,' said the first man. "'Do not attempt to escape us. Death will be instantaneous.' He drew a glass rod from his pocket, the tip of which glowed with a pale blue light. Again he spoke to his companion, who moved apparently a few feet distance out on the prairie. Suddenly Dick saw old Evan's chain slacken, then Dick slackened too. He understood that though he was unbound, his wrists and ankles were still loosely fastened. The second man took his station beside Luke Evans and motioned to him to rise. The first man beckoned to Dick to do the same. The two prisoners got up upon their feet, trailing each a length of chinky, <sniffs> trailing each a length of clanking chain. Each of the two guards covered his captive with the glass rod and motioned to him to precede him. Choking with fury, Dick obeyed. He had taken a dozen steps with his guard. Oh. He had taken a dozen steps with his guard, uttered a sharp command to halt. When his guard uttered a sharp... Yeah, it must be misprinted or something. When his guard uttered a sharp command to halt, at the same time shouting some word of command. The edge of a door appeared, also seeming to materialize out of space. It widened, and Dick realized that he was looking at the unpainted inner side of a door whose outside was invisible. Beyond the door appeared a flight of steps. Dick passed through and descended them. He counted fifteen. He emerged into a timbered underground passage, well lit with lamps, filled with what seemed to be mercury vapor. Behind him walked his guard. Behind the guard he heard Luke Evans shambling. Both chains were clinking, and again Dick's fury almost overcame him. He controlled himself. 
He had no hope or desire for life, but he meant to strike some sort of blow before he died, if it were possible. They turned out of the timbered passage, Dick's guard now walking at his side, the glass rod menacing his back. Dick found himself in a large subterranean room of extraordinary character. The walls were not merely timbered, but paneled. Pictures hung upon them. There were soft rugs underfoot. There was antique furniture. Everything was in plain sight. There was a door at the farther end, from which came the murmur of voices. Two guards in the same black uniform, but without the ornamental silver braid, stood to attention, long halberds in their hands. One spoke a challenge. The guard at Dick's side answered. The two men stepped backward, each about two feet, and pulled the two cords on either side of a curtain behind the open door. Dick passed through. He stopped in sheer amazement. The gorgeousness of this larger room into which he had entered was almost stupefying. He had seemed to have been lifted bodily from some European palace. Mirrors with gilt edges ran along the side. On the floor was a single huge rug of oriental weave. At the farther end was a throne of gilt, lined with red velvet in which sat a man. An old man, perhaps of eighty years, with a grey peaked beard and fierce commanding features. On his head was a gold crown glittering with gems. About him were gathered some two score men and a few women. Those ranged on either side of the throne wore, like its occupant, robes of red lined with ermine. The rank behind wore shorter robes, less decorative, but no less extraordinary. They might all have stepped out of some medieval court. Behind this second line, and half encircling them, were officers in the black uniform with the silver braid. There had been chattering, but as Dick passed through into the room it was succeeded by complete silence. Dick fixed his eyes upon the old man on the throne. He knew him, knew him for a once famous European ruler who had lost his throne in the war, a man of always of unbalanced mentality, who, after living for years in exile, had been reported dead three years before, a madman who had vanished to make this last attempt upon the world, aided and abetted by the secret group of nobles who had surrounded him in the days of his pomp and power. Old men, all of those in the first line. Madmen, too, perhaps, as madness begets madness. Behind them, younger men, infected by the strange malady, and enthusiastic for their desperate cause. Yes, Dick knew this invisible emperor, lurking here in his underground palace. He knew von Kettler, too, in the second line, close to the emperor's throne and among the women in their robes, grouped picturesquely about that throne, he knew Fridegond Valmy. Dark-haired beneath her coronet, of radiant beauty, she fixed her eyes upon Dick's. Not a muscle of her face quivered. Then only did, then only did Dick see something else, which he had not hitherto observed, owing to its concealment by the robes of those grouped about the Emperor, and the sight of it sent such a thrill of fury through him that he stood where he was, unable to speak or move a muscle. The throne was set on a sort of dais, with three steps in front of it. The lowest of these steps was hollow. Within this hollow appeared the head and shoulders of a man. An, elder, an elderly man, clothed in particolored red and yellow, the time-honored garment of court fools. He was on his hands and knees, and the round of his back fitted into the hollow of the step, and had a flat board over it, so that the emperor, in ascending his throne, would place his foot upon it. He was kept in that position with heavy chains of what looked like gold, which passed about his neck and arms, and fitted into a heavy 
gold staples in the wood. And the old man was President Hargreaves of the United States. The President of the American Republic, chained as a footstool for the Invisible Emperor, the madman who defied the world. Dick stood, petrified, staring into the mild face of the old man, incapable of speech. Then a herald, carrying a long trumpet, to which a square banner was attached, strode forward from one side of the grotesque assemblage. "'Dog, on your knees when His Majesty deigns to admit you to the presence!' he shouted. The guard at Dick's side prodded him with his glass rod. Then the storm of mad fury in Dick's heart released limbs and voice. The cry that came from his lips was like nothing human. He leaped upon the guard with a swift uppercut that sent him sprawling. The glass rod slipped from his hands to the rug, striking the edge of his shoe, and broke to fragments. A single streak of fire shot from it, blasting a black streak across the oriental rug. Dick leaped toward the throne, and the assemblage, as if paralyzed by his sudden maneuver, remained watching him without moving. Then a woman screamed, and instantly the picturesque gathering had dissolved into a mob, placing itself about the person of the Emperor, who sprang from his throne in agitation. Dick was almost at the steps, but it was not at the Emperor that he leaped. He sprang to Hargreaves' side. "'Mr. President, I'm an American,' he babbled. "'We've located this gang. We'll blow them off the face of the earth. "'In chains! God, in chains, sir!' Dick stumbled over the length of his own chain that had been dragging behind him, stumbled, and fell prone upon the floor. Before he could regain his feet, they were upon him. A dozen men were holding him, despite his mad, frenzied struggles, as, at length, he paused, exhausted. One of them, covering his head with a glass rod, looked up at the Emperor, who had resumed his seat. Dick calmed himself. Still gripped, he straightened his body, and gave the mad monarch back look for look. For a moment, the two men regarded each other. Then a peal of laughter broke from the invisible Emperor's lips. And anyone who heard that peal anyone save those accustomed to him, might have known that it was a madman's laughter. He flung back his head and laughed, and the whole crowd laughed too. All those sycophants roared and chuckled, all except Fredegond. It was not till afterward that Dick remembered that. He stood up. Dog of an American, he roared. Do you know why you were brought here? It was because I wanted one Yankee to live and see the irresistible powers that I exercise, so that he can go back and report on them to those fools in Washington who think they can defy me, the messenger of the All-Highest. I tell you that the things I have done are nothing in comparison with the things I have yet to do, if your insane government of pig-headed fools persists in its defiance. It is my plan to send you back to tell them that their president lies bound in gold chains as my footstool, that the hurricane which spread the gas through southern America was a mere summer zephyr in comparison with the storm that I shall send next. All the resources of nature are at my command, thanks to the illustrious chemists who have been secretly working for the past ten years to serve me. I, the All-Highest, have been commanded by the Almighty to scourge the world for its insolence in rejecting me, and especially the pig race of Yankees, whose pride has grown so great. Mine is the divinely appointed task to cast down your 
ridiculous democracies and reestablish the divine world order of an emperor and his nobility. That is why I have chosen to permit so mean a thing as you to live. As for the old fool beside you, who thought to stay my power with his box of tricks, his gas box is already being analyzed by my chemists, and in a few hours the trivial secret will be at my disposal. And that's where, just where you're wrong, piped old Luke Evans in his cracked voice. That gas can't be analyzed, because it contains an unknown isotope. And, as for yourself, you're nothing about but a daft old fool with your tin horn trumpery. For a moment, the Emperor stood like a statue, staring at old Luke. The expression on his face was that of a madman, but a madman through whose brain a stra straggling ray of realization has dawned. It was the look upon his face that held the whole assemblage spellbound. Then, suddenly, came intervention. Through a doorway in the side of the hall came one of the officers in black. He advanced to the foot of the throne and made a deep, hurried bow, speaking rapidly in some language incomprehensible to Dick. The Emperor started, and then a peal of laughter left his lips. <laughs> Pig of a Yankee, he shouted to Dick. Your contemptible navy is now approaching our shores with a dirigible scout above it. You shall now see how I deal with such swine. Chapter 10 the tricks of the trade. He barked a command, and instantly Dick was seized by two of the guards, one of whom, the one Dick had knocked out, took the occasion to administer a buffeting in the process of overcoming him. For the sight of the honored President of the United States, that kindly old man straining his eyes to meet Dick's own, in the parti-colored garb of red and yellow, and chained like a beast below the madman's throne, again filled Dick with a fury beyond all control. It was only when he had been half-stunned again by the vicious blows of his captors, delivered with short truncheons of heavy wood, that at length he desisted from his futile struggle. With swimming eyes he looked upon the gathering about the throne, which, again taking its cue from the madman, way was roaring with laughter at his antics. And again Dick's eyes encountered those of Fridagond Valmy. The girl was not smiling. She was looking straight at him, and for a moment it seemed to Dick as if he read some message in her eyes. Only for an instant that idea flashed through his mind. He was in no mood to receive messages. As he stood, panting like a wild beast at bay, suddenly a filmy substance was thrown over his head from behind. Then, as his face emerged, and the rest of his body was swiftly enveloped, he realized what was happening. They had thrown over him one of the invisible garments. He could feel the stuff about him, but he could no longer see his own body or limbs. From his own ken, Dick Rennell had vanished utterly. Where his legs and feet should have been, there was only the rug, with the burn from the glass tube. He raised one arm and could not see arm or fingers. In another moment, invisible cords had been flung around him. Dick's efforts to renew the struggle were quickly cut short. Trust helplessly, he could only stand glaring at the madman, rocking with laughter upon his tinsel throne. Beside him, similarly bound, stood Luke Evans, but Dick was only conscious of the old man's presence by reason of the short, rasping, emphatic curses that broke from his lips. The Emperor turned on his throne and beckoned to von Kettler, who approached with a deferential bow. "'Nobility! We charge you with the care of these two prisoners!' he addressed him. Have the old one removed to the laboratory, and give orders that he shall assist our chemists on the, to the best of his power in their analysis of the black gas. 
As for the other, take him up to the central office and show him how we deal with Yankees and all other pigs. Show him everything, so that he may take back a correct account of our irresistible powers when we dismiss him. Come, barked one of the guards in Dick's ear. Dick attempted no further resistance. Convinced of its futility, sick and reeling from the blows he had received, he accompanied his captors quietly. There was nothing more that he could do either for President Hargreaves or for Old Luke, but he still imagined the possibility of somehow warning the approaching fleet or the occupants of the dirigible. He was led along the passage, past the guards, and up the stairs again. The top opened upon vacancy. It closed and vanished. Dick felt the rugs beneath his feet, but he was to all appearances standing on a square of bare earth in the middle of a prairie. Come! barked the guard again and Dick accompanied him, trailing his silver chain. Behind him came von Kettler. "'Here are steps,' said the guard, after they had proceeded a short distance. Dick stumbled against the lowest step of an invisible flight. The breeze was cut off, showing that they had entered a building. Underneath was a large oval of bare ground. Dick found a handrail and groped his way up around a spiral staircase, four flights of it. "'Here is a room!' Dick saw that widening edge of the door again. The room, was in, the room inside was perfectly visible, though it seemed to be supported upon air. It was a spheroid of a huge size, with a number of large windows set into the walls, and it was filled with machinery. About a dozen workmen in, the blue, blou in blue blouses were moving to and fro, attending to what appeared to be a number of enormous dynamos, but there were other apparatus of whose significance Dick was ignorant. The dynamos were whirring with intense velocity, but not the slightest sound was audible. Von Kettler stepped to a switch, attached to a stanchion of white metal, surrounded by a huge opaque glass dome, and threw it over. Instantly the hum and whirr of machinery became audible, the sound of footsteps, the voices of the workmen, and the creak of boards beneath their feet. You see, we have discovered the means of destroying sound waves as well as shadows, and it was a much simpler feat, said von Kettler with a sneer. Tell them that when you get back to Washington, Yankee pig. Also, you might be interested to know that most of your bombs fell on camouflaged structures that we had erected with the intention of deceiving you. He gestured to Dick to precede him and halted him at a plain, round iron pipe, or rod, that rose up through the floor and passed through the roof. It was surrounded by a mesh of fine wire. Attached to it were various gauges, with dials showing red and black numbers. "'This is perhaps our greatest achievement, swine,' remarked von Kettler affably. "'You shall see its operations from above.' He pointed to a narrow spiral staircase rising at the far end of the room. It is the practical application of Einstein's gravitation and electricity in field relation. It is by means of this, and the three dynamos on the ground, that we were able to neutralize your engines last night, and bring them down where we wanted them. You must be sure to tell the Washington Hogs about that. He motioned to Dick to cross the room and ascend the spiraled staircase. Following him, he flung another switch similar to the first one, and instantly all sound within the room was cut off. They ascended the winding flight and emerged upon a floor or platform. Dick felt it under his feet, but he could see nothing except the ground far beneath him. He seemed to be suspended in the void. He stopped, groping, hesitating to advance. Von Kettler's jarring laugh grated on his ears. Ha <laughs> ha! Don't be afraid, swine, he jeered. This place is enclosed. There is a shadow-breaking device on every floor, which renders us complete masters of camouflage. A switch snapped. Dick found himself instantly in a rotunda, 
roofed with glass, sections of which were raised to a height of three or four feet from the wooden base, admitting a gentle breeze. Three or four men were moving about in it, but these wore the black uniform with the silver braid, and von Kettler's manner was deferential as he addressed them, jerking his hand contemptuously toward Dick. Grins of derision and malice appeared on all the faces. Save one, an elderly officer, apparently of high rank, who came forward and raised his hand to the salute. Captain Rennell, he said, we are at war with your nation, but we are also, I hope, gentlemen. He turned to von Kettler. It is seemly, he asked, that an officer of the American army should be brought here in chains and cords. Excellency, it is at his majesty's command responded von Kettler, with a servile smirk that hardly concealed his elation. Moreover, the American is to witness the forthcoming destruction of the Yankee fleet. The elderly officer reddened, turned away without replying. Dick looked about him. There was less machinery in this room. The iron pillar that he had seen came through the floor and terminated some five feet above it in another of the opaque glass domes, filled with iridescent fire. About it was a complicated arrangement of dials and gauges. At the center of the room was a sort of camera obscura. A large hood projected above a flat table, and an officer was half concealed beneath it, apparently studying the table busily. Come, American, you shall see your navy on its way to destruction, said von Kettler, beckoning Dick within the hood. The officer stepped from the table, whose top was a sheet of silvered glass, leaving von Kettler and Dick in front of it. Dick looked. At first he could see nothing but the vast stretch of sea. Then he began to make out tiny dots at the table's end, terminating in minute blurs that were evidently smoke from the funnels. "'Your ships,' said von Kettler, smiling. "'This is the dirigible.' He pointed to another dot that came into sight and disappeared almost instantly. "'They are a hundred and fifty miles away. Explain to your friends in Washington that our super-telescopic sights are based upon a refraction of light that overcomes the Earth's curvature.' It is simple, but it happens not to have been worked out until my master commanded it. Dick watched those tiny dots in fascination, mentally computing. At an average speed of fifty knots an hour, the squadron's steaming rate, they should be off the coast within three hours. The dirigible would take two if it went ahead to scout, as was almost certain. Dick stepped back from beneath the hood and glanced about him. If only his arms were not bound, he might still do enough damage within a few seconds to put the deadlier machinery out of commission. If only the silvered mirror. He glanced about him. Von Kettler, interpreting his thought, smiled coolly. You are helpless, my dear Yankee pig, he said, but there is more to see. Oblige me by accompanying me to the top story. He pointed to a ladder running up beside the iron pillar through an opening in the roof, and Dick, with a shrug of the shoulders, complied. He emerged upon a small platform, apparently protruding into vacancy. Far underneath he saw the clearing, and two airplanes on the tarmac, the aviators looking like beetles from that height. He looked out to sea and saw no signs of the fleet. "'You have heard of St. Simeon's Stylites, Yankee?' purred von Kettler, "'the gentleman who spent forty years of his life upon a tall pillar in atonement for his sins. "'It is his majesty's desire that you spend, not forty years, but two or three hours up here, "'meditating upon his grandeur before returning to earth.' It is also possible that you will witness something of considerable interest. Look out to sea. Dick turned his head involuntarily. He heard von Kettler's laugh, heard the snap of a switch. Then suddenly he was alone in the void. 
At that snap of the switch, everything had vanished from view behind him, the building, even the platform on which he stood. His feet seemed to rest on nothing, yet below him he could still see the airplanes and more being wheeled out. A sense of extreme physical nausea overcame him. He reeled, then managed to steady himself. He, too, was invisible to his own eyes. Involuntarily, he cried out. No sound came from his lips. He stood there, invisible, in an invisible, soundless void. For what seemed like an unending period, he had occupied himself with endeavoring to obtain the sense of balance. Then, with a great effort, he managed to loosen the cords that bound his right arm to his side. A mighty wrench, and he had slipped them up above his elbow. His right lower arm was free. He extended it cautiously, and his hand encountered a railing. Instantly, he felt more at ease. He began moving slowly around in a widening circle, and discovered that the platform was enclosed. The further side was, however, open, and he began sliding forward, foot by foot, to locate himself. Once his foot slipped over the edge, and he drew back hastily. He fell on the other side, and discovered that he was upon what seemed a plank wall, perhaps a hundred and fifty feet above the ground, with no rail on either side, and some six feet wide. Very cautiously he shuffled his way along it. It was solid enough, although invisible, but more than once Dick walked perilously close to one edge or the other. At length he went down on his hands and knees, and proceeded, crawling, until his movements were arrested by what was unmistakably a door. The plank bridge, then, connected the top stories of two buildings, but what the second was there was no means of knowing. The door was barred on the other side, and did not yield an iota to Dick's cautious pressure cautious pressure. Dick felt the frame. Beyond was glass, reinforced with iron on the outside, the latter metal forming a sort of latticework. Cautiously, Dick began to crawl up the rounded dome. This place does not sound OSHA compliant. Foot by foot he made his way, clinging to the iron bars, until he felt that he had reached the point of the dome's maximum convexity. He wedged his feet against a bar and rested. Only now was it brought home to him that it would be impossible for him to find his way back to the plank. A long time must have passed, for, looking out to sea, he could see the squadron now, minute points on the horizon, exuding smudges of smoke. The dirigible was still invisible. The airplanes had either left the tarmac or had been wrapped in the gas-impregnated cloth, for both they and the aviators had vanished. Suddenly, Dick had an odd sensation that the iron was growing warm. In another moment or two, he had no doubt of it. The iron bar he clutched was distinctly warm. It was growing hot. He shifted his grasp to the adjacent bar, and even in that moment the heat had increased perceptibly. Suddenly there came a vibration, a sense of movement. Dick was swam being swung outward. The whole dome seemed to be dropping into space. He dug his feet and fingers under the hot rods and felt himself sliding over on his back. Back, back, till he was lying horizontally in space and clutching desperately at the iron bar, which was growing hotter every moment. The sliding movement ceased. It was as if the whole upper section of the glass dome had opened outward. But the heat of the bars was becoming unbearable, and gusts of hot air seemed to be proceeding from within. Hot or not, Dick's only alternative was to work his way back to the stable portion of the dome, or to frizzle until he dropped through space. Clinging desperately to the bars, he began working back, reaching from bar excuse me, reaching from bar to bar with his right hand and dragging his feet, with the clanking chain attached, from bar to bar also. How he gained the base of the dome, he was never able afterward to understand. The heat had grown intolerable. His hands were blistering. 
Somehow he reached it. He rested a moment, despite the heat. But to find the plank wall was clearly impossible. In another minute he must drop. Better that than to fry there like St. Lawrence on his griddle. And then, just when he had resigned himself to that last drop, there came an unexpected diversion. Almost beside him, a window was hung back. A man looked out. Dick saw one of the workmen in the blue blouses, and, behind him, within the dome, what seemed like an empty room. Dick was slightly above the man. As his head and shoulders appeared, he let himself go, landing squarely across his back. He slid down his shoulders through the open window into the interior of the dome. The man, flung against the frame of the window by the shock, uttered a piercing cry. Before he could recover his stand, or take in what had happened to him, Dick had gained his feet and leaped upon him. His right hand closed upon his throat. He bore him to the floor and choked him into insensibility. Chapter 11 In the Laboratory not until the man's struggles had ceased, and he lay unconscious, panting and blue in the face, did Dick release him. Then he looked about him. Save for the workman, he was alone in a rotunda, open to the sky, and, as he had supposed, the whole upper portion of the dome had been flung back, leaving an immense aperture into which the sun was shining, flecking the interior with shafts of light. The temperature, despite the opening of the dome, must have been in excess of a hundred and twenty-five degrees. There was nothing except an immense central shaft, up which ran a hollow pole of glass, cut off by the invisible paint at the summit of the dome. The inside of this glass pole was glowing with colored fires, and it was from this that the intolerable heat came, though its function Dick could not imagine. One thing was clear. It was growing hotter each moment. To remain in that rotunda meant death within a brief period of time. And there was no way out. Dick glared around him, searching the glass walls in vain. No semblance of a stairway or ladder, even. Yet the workman must have entered by some ingress, if only Dick could discover it. He began running around the interior of the dome in the brilliant sunshine, searching frantically for that ingress, and it was growing hotter. The sweat was pouring down his face beneath the invisible garment. Dick was vaguely aware that the silence switch had been thrown in the room, for his feet made no sound, but the knowledge was latent in his mind. Two or three times he circumnavigated the interior of the dome like a rat in a trap. Then, suddenly, he saw a section of the flooring rise in a corner, and a workman in a blue blouse appear out of the trap door. He stood there, his face muscles working as he shouted for his companion, but no sound came from his lips. As he looked about him, and saw the unconscious man beside the window, he started in his direction. With a shout, Dick hurled himself toward him, and he checked himself even as he was about to leap, for he realized that the second workman neither saw nor heard him. Yet some subconscious impression of danger must have reached his mind, for the workman stopped too, instinctively assuming an attitude of defense. Dick gathered a dozen links of his wrist chain in his right hand, leaped, and struck. The workman crumpled to the floor, a little thread of blood creeping from his right temple. It was the thing upon which Dick looked back afterward with less satisfaction than any other, leaving the two unconscious men in that room of death. Yet there was nothing else he could have done. He ran to the trap and saw a ladder head leading down. In a moment he had swung himself through and closed the trap behind him. The material that lined the walls below must have had almost perfect insulating qualities, for the temperature here was no hotter than in the Bahamas on a hot summer day. Dick scrambled down the ladder and found himself in a machine shop. Nobody was there, and tools of all sorts were lying about, as well as machinery whose purpose he did not understand. A pair of heavy pliers and a vice were sufficient to rid Dick of his wrist and ankle chains in a minute or two. 
With a knife, he slashed the cords of invisible stuff that bound him. He stood up, cramped but free. He picked up an iron bar that was lying loose on a table beside a machine and advanced to the staircase in one corner of the shop. As he approached it, another workman came running up. Dick stood aside in an embrasure in the wall partly occupied by a machine. The man passed within two feet of him and never saw him. Only then did Dick quite realize that he was actually invisible. The moment the man had passed him, Dick ran to the staircase. He descended one flight. He was halfway down another when a yell of pain and imprecation came to his ears. He knew that voice. It was Luke Evans. With three bounds, Dick reached the bottom of the stairs. He saw a large room in front of him. No mistaking the nature of this room. It was an ordinary laboratory, fitted out with the greatest elaboration and divided into two parts by paneling. And sight and sound were on. In the part nearer Dick, three men were grouped about a large dynamo, which was sending out a high musical note as it spun. Levers and dials were all about it, and above it was the base of gla the glass tube that Dick had seen above. In the other part were five or six men. Three of them were testing some substance at a table. Three more were gathered about old Luke Evans, whose silver chains were had been removed and replaced by ropes, which bound his limbs, and also bound him to a heavy chair, which seemed to be affixed to the ground. One of the three had a piece of metal in a pair of long-handled pliers. It was white-hot, and a white electric spark that shot to and fro between two terminals close by showed where it had been heated. Dick started. He recognized one of the three men as Von Kettler. He moved forward, very softly, his feet making no sound on the fiber matting that covered the floor. Did that feel good, American swine? asked von Kettler softly, and Dick saw, with horror, a red wheel on the man's forehead. Now you are perhaps in a more gracious mood, Professor. The unknown isotope in that black gas of yours. You are disposed to give us the chemical formula? I'll see you in hell first, raved old Luke Evans, writhing in his chair. Von Kettler turned to the man holding the white-hot metal and nodded. But at that moment, a door behind Evans's chair opened, and Friedegond Valmy appeared in the entrance. Von Kettler turned hastily, snatched the pliers from the man's hand, and laid the metal in a receptacle. But the girl had seen the action. She looked at the wheel on Luke's forehead and clenched her hands, her eyes dilated with horror. "'You have been torturing him, Hugo!' she cried. Frida, what are you doing here? Oblige me by withdrawing immediately, cried von Kettler. Where is Captain Randall? the girl retorted. I will know. He is upstairs, watching the approaching Yankee fleet, and waiting to see its destruction, returned the other. You are lying to me. He has been killed, and this old man has been tortured, cried Friedegond. I tell you, Hugo von Kettler, you are no longer a half-brother of mine. I am through with you. Unfortunately, sneered von Kettler, it is not possible to dispose of a family relationship so easily. "'It is cheap to sneer,' the girl re retorted. "'But you sang a very different song when you were in the penitentiary, "'in terror of death, and you begged me to come and throw you the invisible robe through the bars. "'You promised me then that you would abandon this mad enterprise and come away with me. "'You swore it.' "'I have sworn allegiance to my emperor, and that comes first, retorted von Kettler. "'Oblige me by retiring.' "'I shall do nothing of the sort,' cried the girl hysterically. "'When you used me as a tool in your enterprises in Washington, "'you played upon my patriotism for my conquered country. "'I thought I was undertaking a heroic act. "'I didn't 
dream of the villainy, the cold-blooded murder that was to be wrought. You've kept me here virtually a prisoner, she went on with rising violence, an attendant upon that old madman, your emperor, and his sham court, while more murder is being planned. Where is Captain Rennell, I say? She stamped her foot. I demand that he and this old man be set at liberty at once. Hugo, she pleaded, come away with me. Don't you see what the end must be? This is no heroic enterprise. It is wholesale murder, and that will arouse the conscience of civilized mankind against you. Order that the vortex ray be turned off, she went on, looking through the opening in the partition toward the dynamo. That gas! You cannot be so vile as to send it forth again to destroy the American ships. My dear Frida, retorted the young man coolly, the vortex ray is already charged with the gas, and at a height of twenty thousand feet it is now creating a vacuum that will send the gas upon the wings of a hurricane straight up the Atlantic seaboard. It will obliterate every living thing on board the battleships, from men to rats, and this time we mean to reach New York. As for that swine Rennell, he went on, you heard his majesty announce his intention of sending him back to Washington with the information of our irresistible power. Of course I know that you are in love with him, and that these are qualms of conscience are due to that circumstance. But Dick had hardly heard the latter part of von Kettler's remarks. Suddenly the significance of the dynamo and the superheated room above had come home to him. He had read of such a project years before, in some newspaper, and forgotten about it until that moment. By sending a high-tension current, almost to the limits of the Earth's atmosphere, the article had said, a vortex or vacuum could be set up which would create a hurricane. The tremendous pressure of the inrushing air would make a veritable cyclone, which, taking the course of the prevailing winds, would rush forth on a mission of widespread disaster. And on this hurricane would go the deadly gas, infinitely diluted and yet deadly to all life in its infinitesimal proportion to the atmosphere. And the American fleet was now approaching the Bahama sh Dick forgot Luke Evans, everything else, as the significance of that mechanism in the next room came home to him. He ran like a madman through the space in the partition, and, raising the bar aloft, brought it thudding down upon the dials, twisting and warping them. He struck at the hollow pole, but, glass or not, it defied all his efforts. He seized a heavy lever and flung it into reverse, and two others. Yelling, the three attendants broke and ran. Out of the laboratory, the six came running, collided with the three. Behind them, Dick could see Fridagon Valmy a knife in her hand, slashing at Luke Evans's bonds. Dick swung his bar and brought it crashing down on a head, felling the man like a log. He saw Von Kettler pull one of the glass rods from his pocket and fire blindly. The discharge struck a second lieutenant, second attendant, sorry, and the man dropped screeching, his clothes ablaze. Somebody yelled, He's there! Look at his eyes! and pointed at Dick's face. Dick leaped aside and swung the rod again, felling a third man. The others turned and ran. Von Kettler in the van broke through the door behind Luke Evans's chair and disappeared. Dick ran back to where the old man was standing beside the girl, the discarded robes, ropes at his feet. He flung his hood back. Luke, don't you know me? he shouted. It was creditable to Luke Evans's composure that, though Dick must have presented the aspect of nothing more than a face floating in the air, he retained his composure. "'Sure, I know you, Rennell,' replied the old man, "'and you and me's going to best them devils yet!' "'But the fleet! It's approaching Abaco!' Dick cried. "'I've got to warn them!' 
Fridagon seized him by the arm. Come with me, she cried. If they find you here, they'll kill you. Dick hesitated only a moment, then followed the girl as she dashed for another door on the same side of the laboratory as that by which von Kettler and his men had fled. They dashed down the staircase, and a corridor disclosed itself at the bottom. The girl stopped. "'There is a private way, the Emperor's,' she panted. "'He had it constructed, in case of necessity. I got the keys. I was planning something desperate to stop these murders. I didn't know what.' Dick seized her by the arm. "'What keys?' he demanded. "'The key to the place where President Hargreaves is?' "'Yes, but we must get him. Where is he?' In a cell beneath the throne room. That's overhead. But they'll catch us. Which is the key? asked Dick. The girl produced three or four keys, fumbled with them, handed one to Dick. This way, she cried. They ran along the corridor. Two guards appeared, moving toward them under the electric lights. At the sight of the girl running and Luke Evans, they stopped in surprise. Dick had pulled a hood back over his head. He ran toward them, wielding the iron bar. A mighty swing sent the two toppling over, one unconscious, the other bruised and yelling loudly. "'Here! Here!' gasped Fridagond, stopping before a door. Dick fitted the key to the lock and turned it. Inside, upon a quite visible bed, sat President Hargreaves, unchained. He looked up inquiringly as the three entered. "'Mr. President,' said Dick, throwing back his hood, "'I'm an American officer, and I want to save you. "'There's not much chance, but if you'll come with me—' "'Hargreaves got up and smiled. "'I'm not a military man, sir,' he answered, "'but I'm ready to take that chance rather than—' "'He did not complete the sentence. "'Shouts echoed along the corridor behind them. "'Dick replaced his hood, handed the keys back to the girl.' "'Take Mr. Hargreaves to any place of temporary safety you can,' he said. "'And Mr. Evans, I'll hold them.' "'It's right here, this door,' panted the girl, indicating a door at the end of the passage. The three ran toward it. Dick turned. Five or six guards with von Kettler at their head were running toward him. They saw the three fugitives and set up a shout. Dick had a quick inspiration. He dashed back into the cell, seized the light bed, and dragged it through the doorway into the passage, just in time to send von Kettler and two others sprawling. He brought down the bar upon the head of one of them, shouting as he did so. Then he became aware that the passage was flooded with sunshine. Fridigand had got the door open. He darted back, passed through in the wake of the three, and slammed it shut. Fridigand turned the key. Instantly, Dick found himself with his three companions upon the prairie. Not a vestige of the buildings was apparent anywhere, except for the patches of brown earth. Chapter 12 Von Kettler's End Fridigand took command, repressing her agitation with a visible effort. "'They cannot break down that door,' she said, "'and they dare not ask for another key. "'It will take them a minute or two to go back and reach us around the building, "'but there may be a score of people watching us. "'Let us walk quietly toward the thickets. "'If I am present, they will not suspect anything is wrong.' But Dick stood still, driven into absolute immobility by the conflicting claims of duty. For overhead, high in the blue, was an American dirigible, and at his side was the President of the United States. One or the other of them he must sacrifice. He chose. He ran forward without answering. Those squares of brown earth set side by side were the airplane hangars, and he meant to seize an airplane, if he could find one beneath its coat of invisibility, and fly to warn the dirigible and the fleet. A curious wind was blowing. It seemed to come swirling downward, as no wind that Dick had ever known. It was growing in violence each moment, beating upon his face. As he ran, he was aware of Luke beside him. He heard shouting all about them. Luke had been seen. 
not only Luke, but Hargreaves, who is running after Luke, with Fredegond trying in vain to change his intentions. At the edge of the first brown patch, Dick collided violently with the wall of the invisible hangar, and went reeling back. The shouts were growing louder. Wait! gasped Luke Evans. He had something like a large watch in his hand. He held it out like a pistol, and from it projected a beam of the black gas. Then Dick remembered Colonel Stopford's words. He showed me a watch and said that the salvation of the world was inside the case. I thought him insane. Insane or not, old Luke Evans had concealed the tiny model of the camera box to good purpose. As he swept the black beam around him, the whole mass of buildings sprang into luminosity, the figures of a score of men grouped together and advancing in a threatening mass some distance away, and more. Two airplanes standing side by side upon the tarmac just in front of the hangar, not mere pursuit planes, but six-seaters, formidably armed, with central turrets bow and rear guns, and propellers revolving. Two mechanics stood, staring at the direction of the little group. "'I'm with you,' gasped Hargreaves. "'I'm not a military man, but I've got fightin' blood, and I come f of a fightin' race.' Dick leaped and once more swung the iron bar. The nearer of the two mechanics went down like lead. The second, seeing his companion bludgeoned out of the air, turned and ran. Dick shouted, pointing. Fredegond jumped into the plane, and the president scrambled in behind her. The group, dismayed by the black beam, which Luke Evans was now turning steadily upon them, had halted irresolutely. But suddenly a head appeared, moving swiftly through the air toward the plane. It was Von Kettler, with hood flung back, the face distorted with rage and fury. At his yells, the whole crowd started forward. Dick leaped into the central cockpit, swung the helicopter lever. Something spitted past his face, and a long streak appeared on the turret, where the gas paint had been scored. But he was rising, rising into that increasing wind. He heard a yell of triumph behind him, and that yell of von Kettler's was his undoing. There is the telepathy between close friends, but there is also telepathic sympathy between enemies, and in an instant Dick understood what that shout of triumph portended. He was rising into the line of magnetic force that would anchor his airplane helplessly and leave it to be jerked down and held at von Kettler's mercy. He released the helicopter lever and opened the throttle wide. For an instant, the heavy plane hung dangerously at its low elevation, threatening to nose over. Then Dick regained control and was winging away toward the sea, while yells of baffled fury from behind indicated the chagrin of his enemies. He glanced up. Thank heaven the dirigible had not approached the trap. It was apparently circling overhead. Of course, the observers had seen nothing, had no conception that the headquarters of the Invisible Empire lay below. And yet it seemed to be drifting aimlessly back toward the fleet, erratically as if not under complete control. And Dick could see the ships about a mile offshore, apparently drifting too. They were moving as no American squadron ever moved since the day the first hull was launched, for some of them, turned bow inward toward others, seemed upon the point of collision while others were lagging on the edge of the formation, as if pointing for home. Then, suddenly, the awful truth dawned upon Dick. The occupants of the ships and dirigible alike had been overcome by the deadly gas. Dick banked, turned, leaned forward and shouted to Luke Evans, and, when the old man turned his head, indicated to him to sweep the tarmac with his ray. The thread of black, broadening into a truncated cone, revealed nothing save the luminous outlines of the buildings. Apparently, the tarmac was deserted. It was queer, too, that the silence of the night before was gone. 
Dick shouted again to assure himself of what he knew already, and heard his own voice again. Something had happened. Something unexpected. Or perhaps the crew of the Invisible Emperor, satisfied with the effects of the deadly gas, had not thought it necessary to go to any further trouble. Suddenly, Dick discovered that he was almost within the circle of the line of magnetic force. Hurriedly, he threw over the stick and kicked rudder. It was not until he was again approaching the seashore that it occurred to him that the force, too, was not in operation. He opened the throttle wide and shot seaward. He must ascertain what had happened, and, if not too late, give warning without delay. Then, suddenly, the vicious rattle of gunfire sounded in Dick's ears, and, materializing out of the sky, came von Kettler's face. Startled for an instant, Dick quickly realized that it was von Kettler in his plane, with his hood thrown back. And Dick realized that his own hood was thrown back. Two faces, and nothing else, were the whole visible setting for battle. But that look upon von Kettler's face was even more demoniacal than before. Mad with rage at the prospective escape of his prey, and infuriated by his half-sister's appearance in the plane, von Kettler had thrown all caution to the winds. In his insane hatred, he was prepared to shoot down Dick's plane and send Fredegon to destruction with it. If Dick chose to replace his hood, he would have the madman at his mercy. And, if he had thought about it, he would have done so, with Fredegon sitting behind him. But the idea did not enter his mind. Consumed with rage almost equal to von Kettler's, he only saw there the face of one of those who had inflicted an unspeakable outrage upon the president of his country. The memory of old Hargreaves, chained before the mock emperor's throne, enraged Dick more than the holocaust of lives taken by the assassins. He shouted a wild answer to von Kettler's challenge as his plane sped by and banked. At that moment there came a roaring concussion that shook the plane from prop to tail. Dick turned his head. Somehow, President Hargreaves had contrived to get the rear gun into action, and now he was staring at it as if he could not believe that he had fired it. And that action heartened Dick wonderfully. As von Kettler's face appeared again, he loosed his turret gun in a sweeping blast, and heard von Kettler's gun roar futilely. Again they crossed each other's path, and again and again, two faces only able to gauge roughly the position of their planes. Neither man had succeeded in injuring the other. Once old, Luke, once old Luke turned his black ray upon von Kettler, and for a moment the plane stood out luminously in the blackness, but Dick, yell, le Dick leaned forward and yelled to the old man to desist. And once Dick looked back and saw Fredegond crouched in her cockpit with eyes wide with terror, and yet he read in her eyes the same determination she had expressed in the laboratory. She was through with her half-brother. All this while, the wind had been increasing, making it difficult to maneuver the heavy plane. But now, of a sudden, there came a dead lull, and then, with a whining sound, the wind rushed in again. But this was a wind still more unlike any that Dick had ever known. A mighty gale that revolved circularly, but downward, too, like a vortex, catching the plane and sweeping it into an ever-tightening circle. A man-made gale, upon whose wings the poison gas would spread northward again, carrying unlimited destruction with it. Dick fought in vain to free himself. He was revolving as in a whirlpool, and it required the utmost presence of mind and watchfulness to hold the plane steady. Round and round he spun, and then, suddenly, out of the void materialized von Kettler's face. Von Kettler, helpless too, was spinning round upon the opposite side of the vortex. Thus each airship was upon the tail of the other, and it was a matter of chance which would get the other within the ring sights of the turret gun. 
Von Kettler was so near that his shouts of fury came fitfully to Dick's ears as the wind carried them. Dick, working the controls, knew that not for an instant could he direct his attention from them in order to fire his gun, and the moment Von Kettler attempted to do so, he was doomed. Round and round, struggling, battling in vain, and once more the concussion of the rear gun shook the plane, and a shout from the President reached Dick's ears. Dick turned his head for an instant, long enough to see Von Kettler spinning down through the vortex, and he was going down a fire. President Hargreaves, no military man, had got him, the second time he had ever aligned a gun barrel upon a target. "'Bravo, sir! Bravo!' Dick shouted, and desperately he flung the stick forward and nosed down. No gale, man-made or heaven-made, could carry on its wings three-quarters of a ton of armored, turreted airship. Swirling like a leaf, the plane broke through the clutch of the blast. Instantly it grew calm. Outside that vortex, hardly a breath of air was stirring. It was as if the whole fury of the air was concentrated within that circle. The ground came rushing up. Once more, Dick tried to head seaward. With flying speed lost, he was calculating the exact moment in his downward rush when he could hope to resume control. Would that moment come before he crashed? At less than a hundred feet, he partly regained control. For a moment, the plane seemed to fly on an even keel. Then her nose went down as her speed slackened, and this time there was no salvation. Working desperately to save her, Gr Dick saw the ground loom up before him. He heard the crash as the plane broke into splintering ruin. He had a last vision of old Luke clutching his precious watch. Then everything was dissolved in darkness. Chapter 13 You Can't Down the Marines He's pulling out of it. Keep it up, Gotch. Dick heard the words and opened his eyes. He stared in amazement at the faces about him. Honest, American faces under tropical helmets and above a uniform that he had never expected to see again. It couldn't be real. And yet it was. One word broke from his lips. Marines. He's got it. Don't let him slip, Gotch, grinned one of the friendly faces, and the man named Gotch, who presumably had some qualifications for his job, continued what was meant to be a gentle massage of the nerve centers along Dick's spine. I'm all right, Dick muttered, beginning to realize his surroundings. He was lying on a strip of prairie near the beach, on which the waves were breaking in low ripples about a motorboat that was drawn up. He sat up. The world was swimming about him, but he seemed to have broken bo no he seemed to have no broken bones. Not too far away was the wrecked plane, an incongruous mass of streaks where the fabric had ripped through the gas paint. Where are the others? Dick muttered. Then he was aware of Frida Gonvalmi lying with a white face under a shrub. Her eyes were open and turned toward him. He heard Luke Evans's voice. The old man hobbled round from Dick's back, one arm in a bandage. She's hurt rather bad, Rennell, but we won't know how bad till we can get her away, he said. You've been lying here about an hour since we crashed. President Hargreaves made them take him to the fleet in the other motorboat to see what he could do. He's assumed command. You see, Rennell, that damned gas caught the fleet and put pretty near every man out of commission for good. But these fellows was weren't going to give up. So, since all their officers were gone, they took two of the boats and their arms and equipment and came ashore to settle accounts. And they won't believe there's anybody on the island or any buildings. And I can't make them believe it. God, Rennell, those invisible devils may attack us at any moment. I don't understand what they're waiting for. Gotch spoke. We know you, Captain Reynolds, sir. And this gentleman, we know him too, but he seems a bit queer in his head. 
talking of the invisible emperor's headquarters on this island a mile so mile or so inland. The only invisible thing we found is that piece of a garment we pulled off you. I broke my watch ray machine in the fall, and I can't make them believe, Rennell. Almost wept old, wept old Evans. Tell them I'm not crazy. Dick got upon his feet with an effort, staggered a little, then made his way to Fredegond. He kneeled down beside the girl. She was conscious and smiled faintly, but she could not speak. He pressed her hand, rose, and came back. Mr. Evans is not crazy, he said. The headquarters of the gang is over there, he pointed. Didn't President Hargreaves tell you? He was uh, kind of incoherent, sir. The Marines looked at one another, wondering, was Captain Rennell crazy, too? We've had scouts out through the jungle, sir. There's nothing within five miles of here. They've had a clear view all through to the sea from the top of a hill. I've been there, Dick spoke with conviction. I must tell you that they've got devices that make them practically irresistible. That gas and other things. And they're invisible. But if you boys are willing to follow me, I'll lead you. It means death. I don't know what they're waiting for, but are you willing to follow me? We'll follow you, sir. After a pause, during which Dick read in their eyes the desire to humor a crazy man. We'll follow to hell, sir, if that gang's really there. Take your arms, then. Dick pointed to the stacked rifles. A minute later, the twenty-odd marines, forming an open line that extended from one side of the clearing to the other, were on their way toward the headquarters of the gang, and Dick, leading them, through his head was reeling, though his head was reeling, felt as if his own reason was slipping from him. Had he only dreamed all this? Was it possible that the headquarters of the Invisible Emperor existed on this desolate prairie? If it was true, why had they suddenly become inert, silent? Why had they not long ago wiped out these few marines? And the gale, was it now sweeping northward on its mission of destruction? Half an hour passed. Then the brown patches of the foundations came into view upon the open ground. Here were the hangars, here was the central building, with the Emperor's headquarters. And nothing was visible, nothing stirred, yet at any moment Dick expected the rattle of machine-gun bullets or some more terrific method of destruction. Halt! The line stood still. I'm going forward ahead of you. You'll follow at a distance of twenty paces. When you see me stop, feel for the door in the wall, and if I disappear, follow me. You understand? The Marines assented cheerfully. No harm in humoring this poor devil of an officer who had crashed and lost his wits. Like Luke Evans, shambling up through the line to Dick's side. Dick advanced. At any moment now, the concentrated fire of the Emperor's men should blast them all to smithereens. Nothing happened. And it was no dream, for Dick's outstretched hand encountered the exterior wall of the building. He had gauged his way accurately, too, for a step or two brought him to the door. He stepped inside. He was inside the private door that led to the Emperor's quarters, through which he had passed with Fredegond, Hardgreaves, and Luke Evans in their flight. It had been broken down, contrary to the girls' predictions, and the deserted passage within was perfectly visible to them all. Stupefied, the marines bumped and jostled with each other as they crowded in. If they had been anything but marines, their own heads might have been turned at the discovery of this sudden materialization of a building out of nothingness. Being marines, they only grinned sheepishly and followed along the corridor. The first human being they saw was one of the guards in a black tunic. He was leaning against a wall, and he was human. He was a human being no longer. He looked as if he was asleep, but he was stone dead, with a placid look on his face. Two more dead guards lay across each other, with smiles on their faces. There was a workman in a blue blouse who had been in a tremendous hurry to get somewhere, from his appearance, and had never got there. He had fallen asleep instead, and never wakened. 
Dick found a stairway and led the way up. He thought it ran up to the laboratory, but instead the room into which he emerged was the anteroom of the invisible Emperor's audience hall. Six dead guards lay in a heap in front of the curtain, and they had died as unconcerned as their fellows, to judge by the pacific expressions on their faces. Dick passed through into the throne room. The marines, behind him, for the first time uttered exclamations of awe, of pity. The terrific scene that met Dick's eyes would be burned into his brain till his last day. Upon his throne, head flung back, sat the invisible emperor, his features set in a sardonic leer of death. And all about him, some sitting, some lying, supporting one another, were his court, officers in black uniforms with silver braid, and women's in court dress. And all were dead, too. But they had not known that they had died. They had fallen asleep upon the instant that their own volatile gas reached them. "'I guess that's the explanation, sir,' said old Luke Evans. "'Those devils made the whirlwind and charged it with the gas. But when you reverse that lever, you reverse the process. Instead of projecting the force outwardly, you made a suction, and every atom of the gas that hadn't traveled beyond the radius came rushing back and filled the building.' If we'd entered a half hour later, we'd have been dead ones ourselves, but the gas was volatile enough to disperse through the chinks and crannies. Anyway, it's all over now. Yes, it was all over, Dick thought, as he sat in his deck chair upon the cruiser that was bearing him northward. The menace to world government had been destroyed, with it, and with it all who had been behind it. There would be a new order in the world, a new and kindlier government. Men would feel closer to one another than in the past. Half the personnel of the fleet had escaped the inevitable death, invisible death, <laughs> and only one cruiser and the dirigible had been lost in the confusion. There would be a great reception when they put to in to Charleston. Dick bent over Fredegond, who was asleep in her chair beside him. The ship's surgeon had promised recovery for her. She shouldn't suffer for her half-voluntary part in this business, Dick said to himself. If it was, it was going to be his task to help her forget. And that was The Invisible Death by Victor Rousseau. Well, I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, that'll do it for today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I do this every Saturday. Same time, same station. Uh, I also have a stream on Monday, Mecha Mondays, where I do something involving giant robots or giant robot adjacent. I also have a Warframe Wednesday stream where I do something Warframe related. All right. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye, folks.